Well, thank you very much for having me here today, and thank you to His Excellency for, and the RTA for allowing me to speak here. It's actually interesting. It's great to be back in Dubai. One of the first times I'd ever spoken in front of an incredible audience like this was in Dubai, more towards the beginning of my career. This was the early 2000s, and it was the boom times. Things were going incredible. The vision and the ideas that abounded in Dubai were unlike anything else I'd ever seen before. If you could build it, if you could imagine it, if it conformed within the laws of physics, it could be built, and frankly was built here, and sometimes I think even the boundaries of physics were often pushed. And as a creative guy, it was very exciting. As a developer, we all have a little bit of artistry in ourselves, and to be able to come to a place like this where you had this kind of canvas was just incredible. In 2008, 7 8, with the fall of Lehman Brothers, the world took a turn for the worse, and everyone spoke about turmoil within the region as they did everywhere else. And like everywhere, things were difficult. But standing here today, it's incredible to see that because of great leadership, because of great vision, because of following through on the principles that really led to the initial rise of Dubai, it's great to see that Dubai is back. They've done a great job harnessing the energy and creativity that's always been here and going through the tumultuous times, but coming out on the back end much more solid than they ever had been before. Now, it's interesting, in that speech that I gave almost a decade ago, I can't even believe that it was that long, but I feel like I was a baby at the time, but in talking about it, one of the points that I actually highlighted was infrastructure for an economy like this, for a developing nation such as this, and the need to care for that. Now, it's ironic that 10 years later I'm speaking here with the RTA, talking about the incredible things, whether it be the metro, whether it be the incredible network of roads, because infrastructure is such an important aspect of any economy, of any growing and emerging market. For any country to be successful, you have to address those needs. And interestingly enough, infrastructure, as important as it may be, is always one of those things that people pay much lip service to, but rarely act upon. And when I see, again, the metro and the roadways, and I think about the traffic that I used to face back then, and the incredible long journey that it was from the airport into the center of town, I want to compliment everyone on the job that they've done in creating Dubai and creating that infrastructure network to make it very acceptable and to make it, frankly, one of the best I've seen anywhere in the world. Well done. I hope to take a little bit of time today to go a little bit of a different route. We obviously have some incredible managers in this room and looking at it, whether it be talking about NASA or some of the other project management teams, but ultimately really bringing things back to basics, looking at them from a family business perspective. Some of the principles that have allowed my father and his organization to get to the level that they are today, but perhaps also more importantly, maintain that level of success through what is now a four decade company, going into its third generation with myself and my siblings, now taking over and working at the helm with my father on a very daily basis. And it's interesting, in looking at this, People have asked, you know, how were you able to learn from this? And it wasn't the conventional relationship of teacher and mentor, but it was very much an immersion process, something that we learned from the very beginning, from day one. For us, we learned business from the man who penned the book, The Art of the Deal, by watching him. So one of the questions I'm most often asked is really, what was it like to grow up being the son of Donald Trump? What was it like working within the family business? And ultimately, how did that influence and that immersion into the business at such a very early age influence the way you work yourself today? Now, much of this may not necessarily seem relevant, but it shows the formation of a thought process that went into everything that my father was able to create for his career and ultimately as a leader. First and foremost, despite what it would seem, growing up in a family such as ours was not always that easy. Now, let me caveat that, because obviously anyone looking at this from the, the normal perspective of the outside world would say that sounds ridiculous, but we did have incredible fortune. We had incredible experiences. We obviously had luxuries that most, although many perhaps in this room do have, but most throughout the world would not have in terms of traveling in private planes and going to the best schools and just meeting people that most people wouldn't otherwise get to associate with. But there was also an element of work ethic that was always instilled from the beginning from my father. 
He's known for saying the phrase, you're fired, on The Apprentice, and for firing people on television. And people think he has a good time doing that. But long before he ever coined that phrase officially, in growing up, he used to speak to us and said, well, if you're going to work within the business one day, if you don't like it, if you don't do a good job, I'll fire you like a dog so quick your head will spin. Now, it sounds a little bit harsh, but ultimately, it's true. It's the way he would run a business. It's the way any leader would run a business. Ultimately, the business to him and the legacy that he's created within that business would be too important to sit there and subsidize our employment at the expense of. So it was something that he always brought up to us. It was something that was always very first and foremost in his mind. And growing up with him, it wasn't a conventional father-son relationship. This wasn't something where perhaps we'd go out and play ball in the backyard. That said, he was always available. He made sure that we experienced the things that he did, albeit on his terms, but from a very young age, we were on job sites, we were on work sites, we were in boardroom meetings you know, when we could barely walk. But it was an interesting immersion, something that he thought was very important, and an experience that was invaluable today in terms of our formation of a mindset as it relates to business. Now, the counterparty to this was also a very interesting part. On my mother's side of the family, she grew up in what was then communist Czechoslovakia, uh, in a very blue-collar family. Her father was an electrician, and he saw the lifestyle that we were leading and could have led growing up in the United States in a family such as ours. And he made sure that we also saw the corollary of that. From a very early age, he was very involved in our upbringing, and I spoke the language fluently by the age of three, and by about the age of five or six, he took me with him every summer for six to eight weeks to what was then again, communist Czechoslovakia, and I met friends, I met people from a very different walk of life. This was a country where the president of the nation made less than the average cab driver in New York City. It was an important lesson early on in life. It really made you understand and appreciate what you had growing up. To appreciate the great things that came, and perhaps even the responsibility that came with growing up in a family such as ours. And it was an important lesson, albeit a very different one, than the one that my father had been teaching us for many years. Now, to this corollary, I think my father also recognized the importance of what my grandfather was doing because he very much himself did the same thing for me. From about the age of 12, I went to boarding school. I was living away from home. And that summer when I came home, he first sent me off to my first job where I was working away from home, a few hundred miles away, staying in a, in a very small room away from home, working at the bottom rung of the ladder. This wasn't an opportunity where I could just come in and start off at some sort of executive position, but really starting as a dock attendant at one of the resort properties that we had owned. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later, but again, even from his perspective of coming from here, he wanted to make sure that we saw everything from the bottom up, that one day, if you're gonna tell someone to build a building or to dig a ditch, and you had done it yourself, you understand what it took to do that, and no one could ever then ultimately pull one away from you. Today, I have the great pleasure of being able to work within a family business that's grown, that's incorporated my siblings as well, and it's been an important aspect of learning how to work together because ultimately what we decided long ago was the business was more important than anything else. And so while it's interesting to say, uh, and certainly ironic coming from a Trump, that there would be no ego involved in the decisions that we made, there actually isn't any, and we just decide who's going to do what based on whose skill set is more appropriate for the given task. So now with a little bit of this background out of the way, I wanted to talk about some of the similarities of my father's career that really mimics that of what I saw in Dubai in terms of the transformation. It was interesting, as I started writing this speech, we talk about the ebb and flows of markets and personalities and economies, and I really thought, going back into history, and while the decades don't necessarily jive, the ebb and flow of what happened and is happening currently in Dubai very much is very similar to my father's own career. There was sort of this meteoric rise um, from seemingly nothing to this desire to build and create something that was unique and special and different than something that ever had been done before. There was the fame, the stories, the glitz, the glam, and everything else that was associated with that. There was the creation essentially of a brand, an incredible brand that stood for everything that was first class. Then there were the tough times. My father experienced them in the early 90s. He learned from those mistakes not to make them again in the last cycle. Dubai learned incredibly from the 2008 period. 
And as severe as both of those times were for my father and for Dubai as well as the rest of the region, there's the story about the emergence from the other side of that adversity, coming out from this disaster. And again, as I said earlier, looking to Dubai today, not only did they make it through, they made it through in a stronger position than they ever were beforehand. And that's incredibly admirable. As I said, like my father, Dubai went through some very incredible challenges. But similarly, because of the vision and leadership of many of the people in this room, as well as leaders within government, the leadership principles that were instilled pulled this country through to bring it to a place that it had never been and beyond what many people ever expected it could have been. I like to talk about adversity because it's interesting. I always thought that I knew everything there was to know about business for the first eight years of my career. Ultimately, that didn't turn out to be true. It wasn't until experiencing a down cycle, and I went to Wharton, and I thought I knew everything, and I came out of business school you know, thinking that there was nothing that could be taught. But it was the years after 2008, 2009, that you really started to figure out, wait a second, I don't know as much as I think I know, but this is the greatest learning experience I could possibly achieve. Luckily for me, I was able to experience that early in my career rather than later. While seemingly general, many of the operations that happened and many of the decisions that were made, whether it be here or whether it be through my father, were learned through leadership and some of the basic principles. And again, I know there's going to be people that are going to talk about in-depth project management details later on. So I was going to keep it on a very high level picture. <clears throat> my father always said to us, love what you do. It's about as basic as it gets, and yet, coming out of Wharton back in 2000, I remember everyone just wanted to be investment bankers because that's the place that they could make the biggest paycheck. They could make the greatest return on the investment of their college education, and yet, many of these people really didn't want to be in that business. And so when they went to work, they worked a little less hard than the guy next to them. They worked a little bit less than the guy that really wanted to be there. And ultimately, the process, whether they figured it out for themselves or whether their managing directors forced them into it, really weeded out these people. Now, loving what you do is incredibly important. It allows you to put in the time that needs to be put in to make sure that you have the successes that you want. But it's also not a substitute for the hard work that's necessary to actually accomplish anything. Loving what you do allows you to do that more easily. It allows you to do it with a smile on your face because life's too short to be miserable every day. But you still have to be able to put in that hard work. And that was an interesting lesson to be learned in a very hard way. Perseverance and persistence were some of the other things that I saw my father doing. That sort of fight to the death, never give up mentality. As I said, I've been lucky growing up in a real estate cycle that was always positive, but to my father, he looked at things very differently. I, again, had thought that I knew everything that I needed to know up until this time, but there was something that I didn't know, and it was that adversity. And that was something that my father had talked to me about. And it was interesting to see a man who was known for his risk-taking, who was known for sort of being brash and being out there, telling me, this 20-something-year-old, hey, you know, don't be so glib, don't be so aggressive about going forward on this, because I've seen what happens when you sort of lose control of things, when you just go after things because you'd love to do them. And there's also that same element of the decision-making process that he had through that adversity. The thought to never give up, to always fight every battle all the way to the end. It was something very different than you'd see most people do, because frankly, giving up is often the easy way out for a lot of people, but he didn't do that. He came stronger, he came back stronger with incredible fundamentals. And he had to get through rough times. And he did that by working harder than everyone else by getting in there, by not settling, by not becoming a settler, by fighting every last battle as much as he possibly could. I also, during this time, and again, I was a teenager when it was happening, but I learned a lot about focus. I remember sitting with my father when the world was not so great for him, and he was in a very bad spot, at least financially, and he told me, he was like, you know what, over the last few years I found myself doing things I had never done before things that I would have never otherwise been doing. And I remember you know, asking him you know, what those things were. He's like, well, you know, last week I was in Milan. The week before that I was in Paris for the fashion shows. Saying, you have no interest whatsoever in fashion. He goes, yes, I understand. But I did have some interest in what was wearing the fashion. And I made that perhaps a little bit too much of my focus. And I lost track of what I really wanted to do in business and in terms of that. And so it was interesting to see his own critical assessment of himself, recognizing that 
Some of the simple pleasures, perhaps for himself in life, were things that could have influenced him negatively and really impacted the business in a way that would hurt him and his legacy. Now, one of the interesting stories I always tell my, of my father was growing up every day before school, and I'm in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, as a very young kid. He used to, I'd go to him, give him a hug goodbye before I'd go off to school, and he'd go off to work. And the first thing he always told us was, Don, don't ever trust anyone. I'm saying, I'm a five-year-old kid, I have no idea what this means at this point in life. No clue whatsoever. Uh, and he'd been telling me this for about a year, and I remember, I think I was probably in second grade, so let's call it seven years old. And he said, you know, before going to school, he goes, Don, don't trust anyone ever. And he goes, follows that up with, well, do you trust me? And I said, of course I trust you, you're my father. And it was the first major look of disappointment I'd ever seen in his eyes, because the lesson clearly didn't stick. Um, but it was interesting to watch, to see how he looks at the world, and how he had looked at the world, you know, choosing not to look at it through the rose-colored glasses that many people do, but looking at it in a way that, saying, you know what, there are people out there that want what you have. There are people that will do whatever it is that they can to take that away from you. You have to be able to look at it from a cynical nature. And when people do attack, he's often gotten in trouble for perhaps taking this stance on things, attack them back even harder than you did before. It sets a precedent when you become a hard target as opposed to a soft target, when you take the aggressive stance, when you take that kind of approach, people are much likely or less likely to mess with you in the future. Now, again, I thought these were probably very strong lessons to learn as a six and seven year old child. At the same time, looking at it now from a business perspective and looking at the world in which we live and which we know, it was actually a very important one. Momentum was an interesting word that he always used, and he tells a story about, you know, and perhaps other than our gentleman friend from NASA here, probably a word that many of us feared ever since high school physics. But he tells the story of a friend of his who was a developer who was sort of the it guy in New York before, in my father's generation, before him. And he remembers the story of a William Levitt who created Levittown out in Long Island and basically created a town named after himself uh, with the infrastructure and everything associated with it. And this was a gentleman who just built an incredible business, um, similar to perhaps many of the companies that we're talking about and see in Dubai today. Just massive developments catering to the baby boomer generation coming back after World War II. And my father very much looked up to this gentleman. And William Levitt had this incredible company, and one day someone came in and gave him an offer he couldn't refuse, and he sold his company. And he moved to the south of France on a boat, and he spent a few years there. And he, this guy, these guys that took over the company, they weren't able to do what he was able to do. They didn't have his sort of magic, his ability to guide destiny and to create. So they came back to him after a few years, and they said, well, we'd love to sell you back the company at pennies on the dollar. And he said, this is a great <laughs> offer. It's an offer I couldn't refuse. And he took it back over and spent the rest of his life's fortune trying to do what he had done before, but he wasn't able to do it. And my father saw him at this incredible real estate gala dinner that's an annual event every year in New York. And I think it was the first year that my father was ever invited. And this guy was the hero of this gala for many years before him. You know, basically, no one was talking to him. Everyone left him alone because they knew he had lost most of what he had. And unfortunately, again, the realities of the world, once they no longer had it, people were no longer interested. And my father went up to him and said, William, what's you know, what, what happened? What, what happened? And William just said, you know, Donald, I lost my momentum. I took those few years off. I was on the south of France on a boat. When I came back, I didn't want to work the same way that I had. And I, I didn't want to put in the time that it really required to do this job and to do it well. My father, you know, what struck home to him because it was important about not only recognizing when you have it, such as Dubai, and going with it and making sure to take advantage of all those opportunities, but also for the individual, recognizing when you no longer have it and when you no longer have the desire to take those kind of risks. Some of the interesting things that I've learned through perhaps osmosis and less through from stories of my father were, first and foremost in life, people don't get anything they don't ask for. You don't get anything by not being assertive. Now again, we talked about me growing up and being a dock attendant at 13, 14 years old, living away from home. I was making minimum wage in the United States plus tips, as we know, that was not a lot, but at least I was out on the dock, it was the sun, I was a young kid, there were girls around, it, it could have been a lot worse. Well, that job wasn't going to last forever, obviously, in the progression of things, and so my father said, the next logical step, you're going to work on a construction site, you're going to work in landscaping and drive heavy equipment and use chainsaws and clear area for this large land development that we were working on. I said, that sounds great. So I started, but about halfway through the summer, I recognized 
There was no tip component of manual labor like this. There was no one paying me to tie up their boat and to look at the beautiful women on their boats. And I said, go to my father after two, three months of incredibly hard work and saying, you know, I've been working like this, but before I used to make minimum wage and tips. Now I'm just making minimum wage and there's no tips. Why didn't I get a raise? And he looked at me very simply and said, well, you didn't ask for one. Why would I pay you more than you were willing to work for? <laughs> Now, that struck home. Now, I tried to renegotiate and go retroactive, and I got a couple days, but not much, because the time was already done, and he wasn't going to go there. But it, it was very interesting to see and to think about the missed opportunities that people have because they fear rejection. Now, this is something that most leaders are probably aware of, but it, it's something that can be trained in that assertiveness to go out there and ask the basic questions of, you know, can I do this, or why can't I do that, is very important. And too many people have to really get over that fear of the simple two-letter word, no. Your worst case scenario when you ask a question is that you end up exactly where you are. Your best case scenario is you get exactly what you want. Somewhere in the middle, if you choose to start negotiations from that point, you end up somewhere. Now, this is perhaps not the appropriate story for this room, but I remember my brother when he was going off to college. I'm a few years older. He goes, Tom, what was the most important piece of advice you ever learned in general? And I told him this story. And he went off to school, and the first holiday, he came back. And he looks at me and goes, Don, that was the greatest piece of advice anyone ever gave me. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't even, I don't even remember the conversation. And he, he recalls the story. And I go, well, explain exactly how you implemented this in school. I, he goes, well, you realize it also works with girls, right? If I just kept asking someone out, eventually they'd say yes. And you know, while it wasn't the intention of the story, I guess the saying holds true. It, it could really be something that can be implemented through all aspects of life. So again, perhaps not the most appropriate venue for this, but I think it goes to show the general outlays of you know, how things can be utilized in ways that you don't always intend or expect them to be used. Some of the other things that we've been fortunate to be able to do is really understanding the balance of risk and reward. For many people, that's a very challenging subject. For us, and being the siblings, or the, the children of Donald Trump and my siblings, we've had to look at things very differently. There's sort of that alpha characteristic that's hopefully bred into our blood, whether it be through his personality or my mother who was a businesswoman in her own right, as well as an Olympic athlete and everything. There's sort of that desire to always be assertive, to always be aggressive, to be out there. But for us, we've had to look at things very differently. The risks that my father took to get to the level that he is today are not necessarily commensurate with the pop possible risks that we take if we try to make those same decisions. For us, I think we have to check some of our ego at the door and be protectors of the brand that he's created, of the assets that he's created, and not just be out there always trying to do the next best thing to top him. It, it's interesting. We have to look at things such as exit strategies, plans B, C, and D, to look at things in a world, in an environment where the only people you hear about are the guys that turn one dollar into a billion but not the billions of people that have turned reasonable fortunes, that turned security, that turned good families into zero, or in many cases less than zero by making bad decisions. The world, the media, skews things so much in favor of the people that do have those incredible stories, but they don't talk about the corollary of that, which is there's 101 times as many people who have ultimately failed in doing that. And so being able to recognize that, check your ego at the door, being able to put those things aside and understand ultimately what's best for the family, what's best for the company, has been really important and very difficult to do, but really through the tumultuous times that I've talked about quite a bit today, understanding that and seeing what can happen and experiencing that early in a career rather than later when perhaps you have more control, more power, and more equity uh, at risk in the game was very important. You have to learn from your mistakes and perhaps learn from the experiences and mistakes that others have made. And again, seeing what happened to my father and going through that time was fundamental in understanding of how the real world works. Some of the interesting things we've been able to do you know, as the next generation coming into the family is we've been talking about proactive versus reactive thinking. So many people in the world today and so many managers wait for things to happen and then react to them as opposed to being assertive and getting out ahead of the problem in terms of proactive thinking. Now, there's countless examples that we could talk about today. I think Dubai is perhaps another great example of that kind of proactive thought process where they had a vision for where they wanted to be. And they did everything they possibly could to get to that vision and to realize that vision. 
to end up with a head start that the rest of the world really can't compete with in terms of the emerging markets, in terms of a place of business for people in the Middle East and for all of the world, which is why, well, perhaps it's not the biggest nation within even the UAE. It is the stomping ground for all of the Fortune 500 companies. They all have a presence here because the vision and leadership that put Dubai here in the first place continues to abound and continues to allow these corporations to realize the successes that Dubai has had and made it a friendly place for people to invest. Loyalty was another great aspect of some things that we learned growing up. It was an important element in growing up in our family. And it was interesting because today in the world of lawyers and litigation, one of the fundamental stories that I heard from my father, but perhaps the reason I'm even here today, was a story about how he was able to build Trump Tower, sort of his original namesake project in the United States, on 57th and 5th, right next to Tiffany's. And the gentleman who owned Tiffany's at the time had air rights, meaning the FAR, above that building, that for my father to build this iconic tower, he would need to purchase and transfer over. And he had met the guy and become very friendly with him over the years. And they finally, you know, over a meal, they struck a deal, and my father said, hey, you know, I'm going to do this, I need a year to be able to put the deal together. And throughout the course of this year, he put together the financing for the building, he started the marketing of it, he got the zoning that he needed. And they finally get to the closing table, and this gentleman's lawyers came in. They said, well, Mr. Trump, you know, things have changed. A lot's happened in this year, these air rights are now worth 10 or 15 times more than you're willing to pay. My father said, oh my God. You know, this wasn't something that's documented, it was just a handshake I had with the principal. And he called the principal and said, listen, what's going on here? And the principal goes, I don't know what you're talking about. What happened at the closing? He goes, well, your lawyers are here and they're saying it's 10 or 15x what it was that we had agreed to a long time ago. And this man came in personally. And he goes to his lawyers who, you know, obviously wanted to show their boss how smart they were and trying to renegotiate. He goes, you don't seem to understand. I gave this man my word. I gave him my handshake. That means more to me than any number, any dollar figure that could be when it comes to the deal itself. And while I may look like I made a horrible deal, this is the deal I made and I'm gonna stick by that. And it was an interesting story. And you know, I, I love when we have deals with people like that because it's so rare in this world to be able to find those kinds of people. And when we do, those are the partnerships that we're able to create. Those are the partnerships that flourish because the handshake still does mean something to some people, and it's been you know, an incredible aspect to be able to learn from. One of the last things I'm gonna leave off on is about creating a track record. A big part of success, oftentimes, is just simply showing up, not always sitting there and waiting for the grand slam, waiting for the, to hit the ball out of the park, but passing up all the small opportunities that present themselves. There was a great guy I know who was a reasonably successful guy, grew up almost like an uncle to me, and he was one of these guys that he always had the next biggest deal, and it was always great, but he was always waiting for something to happen, passing on this deal, passing on the other deals that were much faster that could happen for this great vision of this amazing thing that was one day going to transform him from this to a thousand X. And I remember looking at that guy saying, and seeing him today, those big deals never came through. They always waited. He always waited and passed on the great opportunities. Now, had he done something a little different, had he taken all the singles, had he taken the opportunities that were presenting himself that were good ones, he could have done something well. And a big part of success is ultimately showing up and knowing when to show up and taking those chances, creating your own luck. The last story that I'm going to leave you with today was one of my father's, and it goes back again. This is 91, 92, and he was in about, let's call it, seven or eight billion dollars worth of debt which is not a great position. And he, he tells the story of walking down the street and there was a homeless man in front of Trump Tower who used to sell pencils there for many years. He was a blind man. He was sort of a fixture on Fifth Avenue. And he goes to uh, his second wife, my now ex-stepmother, and he goes, you see that man over there? And she goes, yes. He goes, you realize he's worth about $7 billion more than me right now. She goes, excuse me, I, I don't understand. How could that be? He goes, let me clear this up for you. Assume he's worth nothing. He's worth about $7 billion more than me right now. So that sort of sets the tone for the situation that he was in. Now, there was a banker at this time who was working for one of the major banks, and we probably had a billion dollars with him in debt, and obviously nothing was going on in the early 90s. And this man, he didn't like my father. They never actually met, but he didn't like him. He didn't like the ego, he didn't like the brashness, he didn't like what he stood for. 
and he goes to his board, he goes, I'm going to be the guy that takes down Trump. And this real estate dinner that I mentioned earlier, this is a few years later now, this isn't the 70s or 80s anymore, it's now the early 90s, and this annual real estate dinner in New York, <coughs> my father has the flu, he's sick, which he's never sick. He has the flu, he doesn't, he's in horrible times, he's in $7 billion worth of debt, he knows these bankers are out to try to get him, and he's invited to this dinner and he's supposed to go. He says, you know what, I'm just going to go anyway. Ironically, he's seated next to this guy who the day before told his board that he's making it his life's mission to take down Trump. Everyone at the table knows it, so needless to say, it's a rather awkward uh, couple minutes while everyone gets to know each other. And, uh, you know, again, he's pretty assertive, he's a pretty good conversationalist, and he starts conversation, small talk, just because he's saying, I'm here, what, what the hell, I might as well do something. Well, they start talking, 20 minutes later, they're actually having a pretty good conversation. An hour later, they're actually having a great conversation. He tells them, why don't you come out, let's play golf, let's see what we can do. So my father says, okay, well, let's go to my course, we'll play these other guys. So he picked the two guys that he knew were the worst golfers in the world. He teamed up with this guy because he knew he could beat them. And he showed this guy the greatest day he'd ever had on the golf course. Within about 15 minutes of this round, he turned that negative billion five into the greatest deal that he'd ever made. He got the line of credit that freed him up to do the things that he needed to do. He was able to preserve the assets for not only himself, but I guess ultimately uh, myself and his legacy. And it shows you that a big part of life is just something sh showing up, making the most of a great situation or making the most of a horrible situation and doing what it takes to end up on the other side of that in a positive way. I think Dubai has done an incredible job of that. I think you're a lesson for the rest of the world who struggled because the leadership and vision that you've seen and that I've seen and that you've instilled upon your people and the people in this room has just been incredible and I'd like to thank you all for having me here today. It's been a pleasure.